Oh, glowing. My name is James Davenport. Uh, I spent 10 years teaching uh, mathematicians how to program and using the assessment. I want to talk a bit about my experiences here. Uh, I'm obviously grateful for many tutors, notably Ian and Steph, who helped me over the years in delivering this course. So uh, what's the context? Well, long before the Bond report, uh, maths at Bath had always taught programming. It was, in, it was Fortran when I joined, and I took it to C, and so on. In 2001, computing split from maths, and actually both of them went to Java. Different courses, different credit counts. And Java, of course, is a popular language for teaching, as we discovered when we did our survey, and indeed in industry. So the industry statistics show that Java uh, is just about ahead of C, it's the most popular language, both the top 10. In fact, MATLAB is 11th. So it's not a completely silly language. Uh, there are pretty traditional programming courses assessed by major courseworks and examinations. The, student, the teaching staff and the tutoring staff has significant overlap. There are very similar students in terms of grades. Many of them went on in both cases to do the thick sandwich courses. Nevertheless, the computing course was a success and the maths course wasn't. Essentially, the answer to that was that the the math students were there to do maths, not programming. So our solution back in 2009 was to change the maths course. It was programming and discrete mathematics. We changed the language to MATLAB, but it was a programming course. It wasn't a how to drive MATLAB packages course. And that course described the paper we wrote last year. So I'm not going to talk more about that. I'm going to talk about the assessment. So it was assessed by individual coursework. And in the old course, students would leave the coursework to the last minute find they couldn't program and fail. And some years we had a 40% failure rate, which was uh, painful and embarrassing and caused a lot of resits, et cetera, et cetera, don't want that. So therefore we had a solution, which I picked up from a colleague in Canada, was to have weekly formative exercises, which were assessed on pass-fail basis by the lab tutor. Is it computing the right thing? And we set exercises such that it was easy for the lab tutor to verify that. The stick was, if you don't get enough exercises, your coursework mark is reduced. We did that for a few years until we had enough data, so the carrot could be, the evidence was, if you don't do the exercise, you fail the coursework. No one who did not complete at least half the exercises ever passed the course. And that actually works quite well, so we've dropped the stick now. However, we also need the formative coursework, which is one per semester. Each of them was worth 25%, the other half was the exams. Number of students started at 220. The first year I taught, the greatest number was 330. Um, the coursework marks were 80% correctness and 20% style assessed by the tutors. Style always caused a lot of problems. The tutors were never, it was very hard to make the tutors be harmonious. And I'm not blaming them. We all have different views about style and also different views about correctness and so on, however much you help them. So I really wanted to do the correctness marking automatically. Um, you know, 15 tutors is hard to manage. My thoughts were this. It's much easier to mark a function than a main program. You can write all sorts of tests to call the function. It's actually also much more realistic. I mean, most of us spend most of our time writing functions. We don't actually write that, that many main programs. I also thought Moodle is our VLE. Um, it's quite a good one. We'll get it to handle submission, submission. And we, we can also program it to handle extensions and the office staff for extensions in and so on, and the reporting of marks and all that sort of thing. Indeed, the office wanted just one mark, so I had to use Moodle to add the star marks and the, and the correctness marks and so on and so forth. All much easier than messing around with separate spreadsheets. The only trouble is it's meant bad to submit a zip of their code and Moodle will accept RAS and so on as well and things that uh, wouldn't unzip properly. And I'll talk about this later. My typical problem, I, I had others as well, but this is what I'm going to talk about, was we asked them to evaluate uh, a polynomial by Horner's rule, except it was a matrix polynomial. Um, and of course, there are pitfalls in setting the same coursework every year. So what I actually did was in alternate years, I uh, swap the coefficients, coefficients of the x's because, of course, matrix multiplication is not commutative. You always check with students who pick up a solution from last year that way. It was remarkably effective in discovering that. Um, 
The other trick is you make sure that B1, there's some tests when B1 is not zero and you find solutions due to spot the, the commutativity test for that, but not for the, not for the last multiple by X power B0. And then there are various extra variants. So for, half, for, for more marks, I would ask them to deal with the case when the, when the BI were not sorted or deal with the case when you actually had to cache the powers of X to avoid recomputation. And those were sort of the uh, part of the course where I got the extra marks. My first pitfall was that students can't read specifications. However much you try, however much you get the tutors to debug them, the tutors say yes, and you make their solutions, they all read it and so on. They're used to it. First year students are not. And in year one, the first time I ran this, 40% of the functions being handed in could not actually be called. Just, yeah, MATLAB just said, just couldn't find the function with the right name and the right number of arguments. So tip, my first idea was I would give them the function header. Second idea was to actually give them, give them a trivial test of the form I was going to use, exactly of the form I was going to use. Typical test, for example, n could be two, and I could use one by one matrices and so on. In fact, I strongly recommend tip two in terms of getting, I got, many fewer poor submissions with tip two earlier with tip one. So I got to tip three in year, th tip two in year three. Tip one still less screw up return value and they will. Pitfall and again, they can't read the how to hand in the specification either. So you get folders inside the zips, you get uh, missing functions, you get f people handing in RAS rather than zips and so on. Uh, the first year I did this, I spent an hour debugging the, the hand-ins. So what I actually did was I asked got a TA to do the unpicking, and uh, after a couple of years, uh, one of the TAs just wrote a verification tool, which the students could use to verify they actually got a submission that was valid. Thank you, Ian. That was a really helpful piece of work. Thank you. Another thing to remember, is, and this is not well taught, is that timings on laptops don't work. I emphasize this to students. Uh, the point is, the reason timings on laptops don't work is that when a laptop gets hot, it just automatically, without you noticing it, uh, uh, turns down the frequency and um, uh, runs slower. And you can get some beautiful sinusoidal effects here and they totally destroy any ability to do sensible timing. I always tell the students this, I warn them that they should use it on the university mainframe, but they don't. Uh, the other trouble is that students are incapable of writing incredibly slow code to my eyes. So you can't actually rely on the timings. So all, you never look at absolute times, always look at relative times as n increases. But my strategy was take a small n, Keep doubling it until I find some n zero when we have a time for n zero is greater than one second. So it's it's then it's pretty reproducible at that point. Timings on a Linux machine. Then I take uh, log t of i times n zero when i is one to five and fit a straight line. I would sort the slopes, and so the slope is one for linear programming, uh, two two if it's a quadratic algorithm, and so on. Then you generally see a natural break at about 1.1 or 1.2, because the algorithm is probably n log n rather than n. Look by hand at the solutions near the break to convince myself I found the right point. And that would that's actually remarkably effective. The appeals, I typically get two to four percent appeals which were typically variants on students forgetting that in MATLAB, at least, if you do for i equals 1 to m, a i equals i, that's actually o m squared because the array has to keep growing. And uh, you get some effects in our programming languages. They're constructs which look, look trivial, but actually have a hidden cost. And so I always tell students they should, they should verify their complexity experimentally. The way I'm going to do that, uh, what, last few years actually gave them the scaffolding code that did that uh, finding n0 and uh, compute and computing the slope of a, of a curve. I gave them that code. Um, they don't do it, but still that's life. You give it to them and probably some of them do it. 
The other problem is actually choosing the test data. It's very easy to write a set of test data, which is bimodal. A half the students fail it and get zero, half the students pass them all and get 100%. And uh, certainly the first few years I had to, I found that uh, I was doing like this, I had to go back and rewrite my test data, often two or three times and rerun it. Um, I realized I was not, in particular, it was very easy to have lots of students on zero. My first tip is you, you really give them a test if you're on tip two. I give them the same test and variance on that, probably up to about 40%. Sort of matching the sort of book work ratio you give in a, uh, an exam. Oh, no, and I reserve a few marks at the top for really messy edge cases. So one, for example, I quoted, one is N being zero. The other is non-square AI. X has to be square, but the AIs need me to be compatible with X. And if you've written the specification correctly, that's legal. You don't just give that many marks for it because it's being a bit unfair. You give some, so distinguish the really good students from the, you know, sort of start first from the first is first. And this takes a bit of thinking, my, my, in my view. And actually, it can take going back to the problem as well and making sure you've got the wording such that you're allowed to put some messy edge cases in like this. Not many marks, but some just to get some discrimination at the top. Um, and better references. Uh, thanks very much.